Networking Part 1. In this nugget, we'll be addressing networking, and this will be Part 1. We'll start off by discussing the Network and Sharing Center, which is a great summary location to identify the kind of networking that's going on and your, your own host computer's network relationship to the rest of the hosts on the network. We'll also take a look here at just some general troubleshooting ideas and some things to keep in mind as you try to make sure that the network is running properly. One of the things we'll also take a look at is shares. We want to make sure that your clients are able to properly access their shares we talked about shares in a previous nugget, but here we'll take a look a little bit more specifically how to troubleshoot some of those problems if users are not able to properly connect to them. And then, of course, we'll have to look at some tools. Network troubleshooting does involve some pretty pretty useful tools in identifying where the source of certain problems could be coming from and resolving those problems. Well, I got to tell you, there are very few things that are more frustrating than not being able to access resources you need to get your work done. Uh, for example, if the email server ever goes down or becomes unavailable, wow, the help desk's phone starts ringing almost the very second people can't access their email. Or even worse yet, if people can't access the Internet, boy, people get hot about that one. They got to be able to access the Internet. How else are they going to get their online shopping done and get their Christmas presents and all that kind of stuff? Not to mention the work that they're actually supposed to be able to do. Uh, and to some degree, network resources, if they're unavailable, well, maybe that's kind of a handy excuse for people. <laughs> hey, I really couldn't get much work done today because the network was down. Well, that only lasts so long before you're out of a job. Perhaps that's why I work for myself. But anyway, what we need to look at in this particular nugget is not only how to troubleshoot networking, but also to begin with how to get an overall view of the networking that you already have. And we start that by taking a look at Microsoft's new Network and Sharing Center, which is available here in Windows Vista, as well as in Windows Server 2008. In fact, a lot of the things I'll be showing you in this particular nugget will work for both Vista and Server 2008. Now I'm just going to quickly go through this particular whiteboard because it's much better to just show you by demonstration, but when you look at the Network and Sharing Center, you're going to have a summary view which gives you an overall view of the connectivity that you can experience. Then you're also going to see what network type you have. We talked about that in a previous, uh, previous nugget. I think that was when we talked about the firewall. And then we'll also talk a little bit about sharing and discovery. Uh, you might be able to uh, make certain resources available or to conceal those resources so that they're not readily accessible over the network. We'll also take a look at the network map. Uh, this is something that we probably don't see very often in corporations because it's not available in a domain environment, uh, but I'll at least explain what it is for you. And then we'll also take a look here at the XP utility that you need to download for your XP clients if you're in a mixed environment there. Uh, and it's called the LLTD Responder, and I'll explain what that is here in just a moment. But uh, better yet, let me just go ahead and show you uh, some interface items that shows you the Network and Sharing Center. Notice what I've done right here. I've right-clicked on my little uh, network thingy, for lack of a better term, uh, down in the notification area. Uh, and so I'll just right-click on it, and I'll choose Network and Sharing Center. And it takes me right here. If you'd rather access it through the control panel, well, certainly, of course, you can do that. And if I click back here, you can see it's under control panel, Network and Internet, Network and Sharing Center, and here we are. And then once we're in this interface, we can see that up here at the top, if I move my mouse pointer over these things, then it turns to a hand and I could just click on stuff. Uh, what's this going to do? This just gives me my computer, or I guess they call it computer now. So that's not much different than clicking on computer on the start menu and I could browse drives. This will show me uh, other items that are on the network. Now I'm going to go ahead and click it, and we're going to see that we don't get anything. And why is that? Right up here it says, network discovery and file sharing are turned off. Network computers and devi devices are not visible. Click to change. I could click that, or from within the same interface, I could have also clicked on right down here where it says Network Discovery. I can click that down and then choose, and then choose Turn On Network Discovery and then click Apply. Notice that I do have to be an administrator to be able to approve of that action. Now, you might also think, well, why wouldn't you turn it on? I mean, wouldn't you want to see other stuff on the network and see, I don't know, other servers and stuff like that? Sure. Uh, but you do leave this off by default in many cases because you might be in an unsafe location, such as a, a network Wi-Fi. And if there's a, you know experienced hacker at the network Wi-Fi and he can see your computer available because of you know the network discovery being turned on, uh, then that could be potentially an issue. 
Because note, uh, I can see other network computers and devices, and I'm also visible to other network computers. So uh, it's kind of a two-way street there. Uh, in a domain environment, that's normally going to be okay. This also, by the way, has an advantage over the conventional browsing that we used to do under XP and all previous versions of Windows, because it would use broadcast-based browsing uh, to be able to make those things visible. And although there is still a broadcast that can take place when I turn this on, uh, it is this computer will broadcast its presence to the rest of the network, it's not as chatty in terms of network activity. Uh, also, if you have something like a share available, that can be advertised through uh, Active Directory now as well, and so it's not also not as chatty. Uh, but for the time being, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of collapse this for now. Uh, I could also click up here at where it says Internet, and that would just open up a web browser. I could choose View Full Map also, uh, but that doesn't do anything in a domain. In fact, if I click on it, it tells me it's disabled by default on domain networks. There's a policy that could enable it. But what this would do is also just provide for me another view for seeing other network resources on the network. Um, this is not normally used in a domain environment because it's too chatty and it cr produces more traffic than you probably really want to do. Uh, however, this works really well. and I'm just going to go ahead and turn on Network Discovery right now. So I'll click Apply here, click Continue. And then now when I click on the uh, domain here in the middle, we should be able to see more network activity take place. That's the same one I saw a moment ago, so let me close that open it up again so it refreshes and now I can start to see other network devices in my environment here for example this is actually a replay TV device which is in my house uh, and it's uh, kinda of one of those re um, uh, one of those digital recorders where you can record TV programs and stuff, but since it's on the network, it shows up that way. So does this family room item there. Uh, here's another computer on the network, a couple of a few different uh, wireless access points and so forth. These are actually uh, I actually have two wireless access points, but they appear twice. They appear once as a wireless device and once as a router because they perform both those functions within my within my environment. So that gives you an idea for what you can see then on the network and that was available because I turned on network discovery. Okay, and once again that's where this whole interface is right here. Let's also take a look at some of these other things as well. Let me collapse that again. Uh, one of those would be file sharing. Now if I have a file share, uh, then it should turn this on automatically, uh, but if it doesn't or if someone's turned it off so for some reason or another, you can click the down thing here, of course, the down arrow, <laughs> the down thing, uh, and then you can turn on file sharing, and then once again, this does require administrative access to be able to do that. So when it comes to trying to access resources on the network, especially if it's a troubleshooting scenario of some kind, uh, and it says that you're not able to see other computers on the network, uh, then it could be that network discovery is not available, or if someone says they're trying trying to access a resource on your on your computer but they're not able to see you then that could be because again network discovery is turned off because remember that's a two-way street uh, file sharing you know again if someone's trying to access a you know maybe a folder that has you know some music in it or something that you can you know legally share uh, then perhaps because file sharing is turned off there's also this public folder sharing which you don't really see too often in a domain but if we click the down here here with this we can see that uh, this would allow other people to access the public folder uh, and of course what this does is it just makes available the public folder. I'll just show you where the public folder is here if I can open up uh, Windows Explorer. There we go. Uh, then if I go to you know the name of the user, uh, then we'll see you know we have a number of different things here that are related to my documents. This would be protected, for example. A lot of other things would be just for me. However, if I have something here that I want to put in the public folder, then any of these public items then become available. Maybe I've got documents that I want people to collaborate on and access and so forth. Of course, in a domain, you're much more likely to use a uh, corporation environment. You're more, much more likely to use something like SharePoint. Uh, but that is a, still a possibility. Maybe a small office, home office, that kind of thing. Maybe I've got music that I want to allow you know, the rest of my family to be able to listen to if I'm in a home environment, for example, or family pictures. You know, any of those kinds of things could be put in this. And whatever I put into that, you know, all the users of this same computer have the ability to drop stuff in there. Uh, then once we've done that and we turn on sharing so that anyone with network access can open files, then that's exactly what happens. And the advantage of this, again, for small office, home office types of things, is that it makes sharing really easy. I don't have to understand a lot about NTFS or share permissions or the interaction between the two. I just want people to access my stuff. You know, that, that would make that real simple and easy. 
And as you might guess, the rest of this, let me collapse that one, because then I can actually turn that one on. Uh, the rest of these, it's also going to be pretty much exactly what it says, printer sharing. It's going to turn on printer sharing if I want to do that. I don't have any printers attached to this computer, so it's not available. Uh, but if I did, I could certainly do that. Again, if I would share a printer, then it would automatically turn this. It would almost automatically green light that, so to speak, for us within this interface as well. And then there's this media sharing item. Let me show you that one as well. Uh, what this does is it's going to make things like my media, my pictures, my music videos, those things available on the network. And that's a little bit different than the public folder sharing because it adds an additional layer here to where it makes it available to other media center types of devices. So for example, if I turn that on and I have some video or whatever, then it would enable that so that the Xbox that I have in my living room, I could view that media on my Xbox and view it on the, you know, the big screen TV or my you know, LCD or whatever it is uh, that makes it more visible to you know, other, other people in the household. So, in short, all of this stuff that we've looked at here is just kind of a one-stop shopping to make a lot of these things available and to enable them so that we can uh, adequately share or protect resources in the network. Let's also take a look at some of these links that we see over here. Here I can just view computers and devices, which is the same as clicking this middle item right here. Connect to a network, which doesn't do anything right now because I have no other networks to connect to. Uh, this, would, this would have more options available to me if I had like a dial-up network connection or if I had a wireless network in addition to the one I'm already connected to or a VPN, something like that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up a connection or a network here to illustrate that. And you can see the various things that we can connect to, like the internet if I had to have a, a dial-up connection to the internet, for example. A wireless access or router point where I would have to enter in uh, the SSID and the, maybe a password and uh, you know, other credential information, for example. A dial-up connection, uh, which fortunately we don't have to do that too very, very often anymore. And then finally, connect to a workplace. I'm going to go ahead and use that one uh, to create a VPN connection to another domain besides my existing nuggetlab.com domain. And I'm going to use my internet connection to do that. Then I enter in the uh, internet address, which can be an IP address or a fully qualified domain name provided it can be resolved and accusource.local I think I'm typing all that in right and then I can just enter in the destination name this is just up to you uh, whatever makes sense to you and then I can use a smart card if I want to to help secure the connection so that uh, we have two-factor authentication, meaning that I have both something I know, which would be the pin that's tied into that smart card, and I have the actual smart card itself. And then I can choose to allow other people to use the connection, uh, or if I leave this empty, uh, then that would only apply to my currently logged on account. Or I can also choose don't connect now, just set it up and I'll connect later. I'm going to go ahead and do that so I can show you how to, you would connect later on. And then I'll just enter in the credentials. You can also choose show characters if you want to here. So if I click on that, you'll see my password. You want to see my password? Yeah, fat chance. <laughs> I'm not going to really enter in my real password there and show it to you. But anyway, uh, I'm sure you wouldn't abuse it, but I'm not going to put it in there. Uh, then we'll also have remember the password if you want to. You know, it's a little bit of a security vulnerability there. Uh, but in this case, someone would have to log on to my account anyway. So, you know, it's, you can kind of take or leave it in that sense. And then the name of the domain op is optional. That's just to identify the name of this account. And I'll just enter that in here as well. Okay, so it's in the AccuSource domain. I'll go ahead and uh, create it and close this. And now I'm ready to actually click Connect to a Network. Now we see that we do actually have something that's available to us there. Then when I click on Connect, we'll see that real quickly here, it'll just make a connection once I enter in the password. Okay, and we're authenticated, and that's pretty much it. Now I can just click on Close down here. By the way, you see a little exclamation point down there. It's going to show that just briefly while it's, going, while it's um, uh, getting its IP address from the from the server and so forth because I have a DHCP server there that will issue the IP address. And then notice that I now have an additional connection that appears here. I can view the status if I want to. Uh, not really a whole lot going on with that, but uh, you can view the status if you want to. And then I can also disconnect from that as well. Some of the things that we, we saw there in the status, I'll review with you in a minute here as well, or at a later point in time, when we address troubleshooting our network connections. Then also over on the left here, we have, again, Diagnose and Repair. This is going to open up the Windows Network's Diagnostics. And quite frankly, this, is, this usually works pretty well if you're really experiencing an issue uh, because it kind of automatically goes through a lot of the troubleshooting steps in the background that you or I would normally do from a command line, for example. However, sometimes it does also give you false positives. Here it says it's found a problem that can't be repaired automatically. I'm really not having any problems. I've got fine connectivity all the way around. I can access the internet. Uh, everything's just fine. So I'm uh, not quite sure 
always why this pops up, but if you click on it, it just opens up the help system to identify other reasons why you might be experiencing uh, those types of problems. I'd rather have it be overcautious than not cautious enough, though, so uh, perhaps that's okay. And then over here we see other items as well, Internet Options. This just takes us to the Internet Options that you'll see, that you would normally see from within your browser. And if I click that, this probably looks, you know, very familiar. Same kind of thing we've looked at in a previous video, uh, previous nugget. There's also Semantic Live Update. That's something that a third-party vendor, of course, added into this since I use uh, NAV. Uh, Norton's antivirus, that's what appears there. And then Windows Firewall, which again, we've seen at a previous point in the past. One other thing to talk about here is this last item that I didn't really elaborate on very much. For XP, they have there's something called the uh, Link Layer Topology Discovery Responder. You can go to Microsoft's website for your XP clients, uh, search for it, and download this. Then they become visible when you go into the network map. Now again, we don't have the network map in our environment because we're using a domain. But in the Network and Sharing Center, when we go to View Full Map, uh, that's this is where that those computers would then appear. My XP computers and my Vista and Server 2008 computers would also appear within this list if I downloaded this onto and install it on my XP clients. You also recall from the Network and Sharing Center that we did have these network location types, which we've addressed a few times. One of those was public, remember? Uh, with public, by default, your network discovery and sharing is going to be off, and that's a good idea because I don't want people to browse my computer or access my shares or anything like that when I'm on a public network like a coffee shop, Wi-Fi or something. Now, of course, yeah, they're probably protected by permissions anyway, but I might not want them to even see the folder names because perhaps there's something revealing about the folder name though it might be confidential as well. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be turned off by, auto, uh, by default. You can turn it on if you want to, but it's probably not wise. Then there's also the private item. This would be for a home or work network. When you first establish a new connection to a network, normally it asks you whether it's going to be you know, a public network or a work or home or something like that. If you choose home or work, it uh, goes actually to the private network location types. With this type, also discovery and sharing is turned on by default. That's because there's an assumption that you're in a smaller network here where, where the kinds of broadcasts that take place from discovery and sharing are not going to be overwhelming and not really going to affect the network performance any. But if you're in a domain, which could be hundreds or thousands of computers in the network, then network discovery and sharing is typically turned off. Again, you can turn it on if you want to. But for most domains, by default, it's going to be turned off because a lot of those resources that can be shared from a domain environment can be advertised in Active Directory anyway, so we can save ourselves some broadcast traffic if we leave it off. Now, as it comes to accessing those types of resources, sometimes you do have a little bit of trouble when you try to access a share. So if you try to access a share, someone's told you that it's there, they told you that it's properly shared, should be out there somewhere, and you should be able to see it, but you can't. First of all, just check your connectivity. I'm going to address this a little bit more when I talk about general troubleshooting issues, but make sure that everything's plugged in. This is one of the most common, commonly overlooked things, but it's also one of the more more common problems that could crop up. Some network cable came unplugged, someone plugged it into the wrong router, you know, that sort of thing. I'll readdress that in a moment. There's also the permissions. Remember, you have both share and NTFS permissions. If I have share permissions assigned to a particular folder, then it is going to be visible on the network. Uh, so I should be able to, to access it. But if I double click on it and then it says access denied, then it's probably likely that there are actual underlying NTFS permissions which are denying my account access and so I'll need to clean up or re-permission that resource there. Also, make sure that it actually is shared. A lot of times people will tell you that something is shared, uh, but they didn't really understand what they were doing and it's not really shared, uh, or may have lost the share. I have seen Windows systems do that. It's rare, but I have seen it happen from time to time where maybe there was a uh, something even important, like a home directory that was shared out, and then no one can access resources in their home directory, and it turns out that it suddenly seems to have lost the share. Well, you might have to go back in there and, and reshare it for them. Also, make sure that the firewall is properly configured. Now, if you use Microsoft's firewall and you share a resource on a Windows Vista computer, it should automatically open up these ports for you. And let me show you what's actually taking place kind of behind the scenes there as I go access to uh, our Windows firewall. If I go into change settings here, and you've seen me do this before, so I'm kind of 
quickly going into our exceptions here, because we did all this in a previous uh, previous nugget, then you'll see here that we have uh, sharing that can be turned on, file and printer sharing. So as soon as I share a resource, or I enable the sharing that we saw earlier, if I go back to uh, this item here, remember where if I turn on uh, file sharing, then what should happen is in the firewall, it automatically ticks that box so that it makes it available. I mean, after all, it wouldn't do you much good to share something out and then to have it blocked at the firewall. So there's an assumption made that as long as I'm sharing something, I must want people to access it through the firewall, and it opens up TCP 445 and 139. And uh, if you do use some up somebody else's firewall besides Microsoft, you might need to know that because you may need to open up those ports. Now, it could be additional firewalls. It could be a firewall on my end where I've got the share. It could be a firewall on the client's side where they're trying to access the share from, you know, some remote computer trying to resource, access my resources. Uh, their firewall might not be open for that. Or it could be an intermediate firewall somewhere uh, that maybe the corporation has set up to block this. So check all those locations. And then there could be issues also with name resolution. Hey, if I'm trying to access a, a com resource on a computer called, you know, Vista Client 05, but Vista Client 05 is not properly registered in DNS, I'm not probably not likely to access it. And if it's on another subnet somewhere, broadcasting won't help either because, um, because network devices typically block broadcasts. And if that's the case, I'm definitely going to have to resolve the name resolution issue. But again, I'll come back to that here in just a moment. I think I'll go ahead and address those name resolution items, in fact, at the end of this general troubleshooting item. First of all, though, let's start with Windows, general, uh, Windows Network Diagnostics. We talked about that a little bit earlier, where it sometimes can give you a false positive, but most of the time it really works very, very well. And it does a lot of things that, uh, that we would normally have to do from a command line uh, to resolve the issues. But it does it all in the background for us automatically. And... I'd say a, probably a good 80 or 90 percent of the time, and it really does fix the problem. So it's a pretty good tool. Um, also, there's the connectivity item. Uh, just make sure that you do have end-to-end -end physical connectivity, that your computer is properly plugged in, that no one has actually tripped over the network cable, uh, that you have properly seated network interface cards in their you know, PCI slots, for example. All those kinds of things. Always check the physical because that's very often something that's neglected. It could also be something not necessarily directly attached to your computer, but it could be a network device somewhere along the way, like a, a switch or a router where something's plugged into the wrong port. Uh, and also on the other end of the connection, uh, the server or the client or whatever it is that you're trying to make the connection to might also uh, be missing a connection somehow. And you know, also look for damage. Uh, sometimes there are things that get damaged. Uh, for example, I knew a, a company that had moved into a temporary office space, and they didn't have any place to put the network cables. They couldn't use the ceiling for some reason. I don't think it was one of those dropped ceilings. So they temporarily strung the network cables across the floor, and then they taped them all down with duct tape or gaff tape. Well, they stayed in the office space longer than they expected, and people with their rolling chairs, you know, with the wheels on the bottom of their office chairs, kept rolling over that network cable. Over time, it started to damage that cable, so that sometimes it was making connections, sometimes it wasn't, uh, sometimes the connections were just slow. Well, it turns out that that got frayed, so that was the source of the problem. So just look for that type of thing here as well. And then I already addressed as well the firewall. Just make sure that proper ports are open for whatever it is that you're trying to access. Uh, ser network services and resources usually have a port assigned to a, uh, to a particular resource so that if you open up that, that port on the firewall, people should be able to access that service over the network. Another troubleshooting step to look for here would be name resolution. Um, that's because most of the time, if you do something like map a network drive or map a printer, then it's going to be, according to a UNC path, to a specific server or client somewhere that has a shared resource on it. So make sure that the name resolution is taking place properly. First of all, that when someone maps a drive to that resource, they've typed it in properly. But also, if there's potential name resolution issues, then you can use the ping tool to test that. So if I open up a command prompt, for example, and I ping another host by name. Let me just ping my server. I think it's uh, DC2008. No, DC Nugget 2008. Okay, and press enter, then I see that I'm getting replies back from it. What this is telling me is that there is a DNS server somewhere that resolved not only DC Nugget 2008, but DC Nugget 2008 in its fully qualified domain name. Only a DNS server could have resolved this for me, unless I had also had this in a text-based hosts file 
which is uh, which would appear on my computer in the host file is loaded when the computer starts up. We rarely, if ever, see that happen anymore, though. So I'm not really going to emphasize that a whole lot. That's kind of a becoming more and more of a rarity. So anyway, this tells me that a, a DNS server somewhere did properly resolve to this IP address. Now. This could come up as an issue, however. What if I'm an administrator and I happen to know that that particular server is not on 10.10.10.20, it's on 10.10.10.21? <laughs> well, that would tell me then that probably the DNS server has a stale record and it needs to be updated. Now, that can easily be done even from the server side of things there. If I visit the server, if I uh, remotely connect to it somehow or tell that to it, then I could register that using IP config. And we'll address this at a future point in time when I address some other command line tools. But IP config space forward slash register DNS would then properly register this DNS, this server with its DNS uh, address. Now then on the other hand, what if I clicked on, uh, typed ping, and I'll just uh, re repeat this, and I'll enter in something that doesn't actually exist. What if I'd done something like that, and I was not able to get any responses because it didn't actually exist, or I couldn't, I couldn't find it? Well, it could be that uh, if DC Nugget 2006 actually existed on my network, that it could be that it had not properly, again, registered with my DNS server. And if that's the case, and I can't access it by that name, but I can access it by IP address, let's see, uh, ping... Uh, DC Nugget, actually let me do it by IP address is what I said, didn't I? 10.10.10.100. What if I'm sure that this server right here is on 10.10.10.100 uh, and I press enter here? Well, now I'm getting answers. This is confirmation that, this, that the server is alive and well, but it is not properly registered with any name resolution uh, solution, which is normally going to be a DNS server in today's Windows environments. Another thing you can see here is to use the NSLOOKUP tool. And let me go back to my command prompt here. Uh, NSLOOKUP is useful for identifying which server resolved an IP address uh, to a host name. So, for example, up here when I pinged DC Nugget 2008, what if I wanted to identify which DNS server resolved that for me? Because, and that might be useful if it looks like it's giving me the wrong address. Then that DNS server might need to be updated. Okay, or if it's uh, you know doing something else that looks suspicious, so I would just go NS lookup, and you could do this all from a single line if you want. DC Nugget uh, 2008, um, and then uh, dot nuggetlab dot com. Okay, and then what that's going to tell me then is that the server that properly resolved this address is at 10.10.10.20. Okay, and then it did, and it resolved it through port 53. Anytime you do a DNS query, it occurs through port 23. Now, if you want to go in a little bit more elaborate method here, you can do that as well. NS lookup, and then I could do, just type that, and then it takes me to an NS lookup command prompt, and then I could just enter in now uh, again the name of the host, dcnugget2008.nuggetlab.com, and then I can also set types. You know, maybe I wanted to find a specific type, and let's go outside of my own environment here. I'm going to probably give you more detail than you need to know for the 70-622, but it can be uh, interesting information. What if I wanted to know what name servers were resolving, I don't know, how about how about yahoo.com, okay? So I'll just say, you know, www.yahoo.com, and then it identifies which hosts or which DNS servers have been resolving this. To take it a step further, I can see what kind of... Uh, uh, what servers are resolving certain kinds of services. For example, uh, an MX server, that would be a mail server. I could type set type equals NS, and then uh, again, Yahoo, I'll just do yahoo.com here in this case. And this tells me here that these servers, all these name servers, are resolving uh, the mail server records for Yahoo's mail. Huh, see, so you could get some uh, quite a bit of information out of this. I better exit out of this before we get dangerous, huh? Okay, so we're out of that one right now. Now, the other thing to look for there is recent changes. And this, again, relates to kind of the ping and NS lookup and some other things like that for name resolution. Because if my existing... If my uh, rather if my former IP address was 10.10.10.20 for my file server, but we went in there and we did some subnet changes, we put it on a different network, you know, all kinds of things, then maybe we changed its IP address to 10.10.11.20. Okay, now it's a different IP address, but my clients, which just resolved this address here just five minutes ago, they've still got the old uh, IP address cached in their name resolution cache. So because of that recent change, they're still going to try to access it at this old address instead of the new one. Okay. 
And this is because there's a time to live value. When my clients resolve against a DNS server and they get this old address for you know, DC, you know, dcnugget2008.nuggetlab.com and it resolves to this address, there's a TTL value that the client receives and it says to keep that value for whatever the time to live is configured at. Five minutes, ten minutes, whatever the administrator decided to, to make it. And the advantage of the TTL is that if clients have to re-access that same server at that address, they don't have to hit the DNS server again until the TTL expires and then the client knows that it doesn't have a current record. So we could either wait for the clients for their TTL to expire or we could, um, we could go into them and from an administrative command prompt, you'd have to do an IP config space forward slash flush DNS. And I'll show you that in a whiteboard here as well shortly. All right, then let's go ahead and take a look at some of these tools that I've been mentioning. Let's go back and revisit IP config, which we've looked at a little bit. But now let's look at some of the available options that's also available with IP config and why you would want to use different ones of these. Now, first of all, IP config space forward slash release. Re and renew. Both of these relate to DHCP. Uh, and if you have DHCP servers in your network like I do, then you might see something like this on your servers. And here I've got uh, an IP version 4 DHCP scope. And, uh, and here's the address pool that's available. And so I've got you know, 10.10.10.1 .10 .10 through 254 available. And then these are all exclusions. This just means that these are addresses that I won't give out. Uh, so there's a range of addresses here from 1 to 10, and then three individual addresses that I don't give out. Usually those will be excluded for various purposes, but normally it's going to be something like I've got a print server on one of those addresses, or uh, maybe I've got uh, a specific server that I want to always have a static address that I don't want DHCP to accidentally give out a duplicate address for, uh, that sort of thing. Okay. And then we'll have things like uh, the scope options down here where we've configured the DNS servers. And if I double click on this, actually we don't do it there, we'll do it down here. Uh, the DNS servers that I've got for this, then this identifies the, the th four different DNS servers we're using. Now here's where uh, release and renew would come in handy in the, the IP config options. What if this is what I currently had and if I minimize this, go back to my normal desktop here, then I'll go to uh, administrator's command prompt, and we'll just use that command to, as by way of example. So I'll go ahead and run this here. And I'll just do an IP config. First of all, let's do a forward slash all. Okay. So I've already picked up the IP address for this host, and uh, it's up here somewhere up at the top of the list. And there it is. Okay, It's 10.10.10.28. And here are the, uh, the DNS servers that we've configured. Okay. Now, if you just kind of make a quick mental note of what you see there, notice that on this server, that does indeed match what it's giving out. These are the addresses that it's giving out to my client. But let's say that one of these uh, was, was different. We have decided to change one, remove one, add one, whatever it is. Let's say this, lot of, this bottom one right here, we decided that we needed to remove it. Maybe that server no longer exists and, uh, or it's become defunct for some other reason. So by removing it and then clicking OK, but if I go back to my uh, client over here and I do an IP config all again, we see that we still have that same, that same DNS server here, all four of those, and we're supposed to have three. So what I could do here then is do an IP config space forward slash release. Okay, and that would then mean I have no network connectivity, basically. And by the way, if you look down here at the network icon, we see that I have a physical connection, so we don't see a red X through that or anything. But it's also showing me I don't have the kind of connection I normally would have, where it would have an internet connection as well, because uh, so, there's no globe on that little uh, notification area icon. Okay, that normally the globe means that I have internet connectivity. But now, once I've done IP config release, I can do IP config renew, and you do have to do all of this, by the way, from an administrator command prompt. Okay. Now once I've got that renew ent entered in there, I'll press enter again here. And then this time we should see if I do another IP config, we, we got an address here. Okay, so we're good for that. IP config space all. Now this time I should see three DNS addresses, and certainly I do. So what was the advantage of using IP config here? Uh, well, first of all, when I released it, I just kind of wanted to get a, a clean start, so I released my existing address, which includes all my configuration items like default gateway and the DNS servers that we saw. And then I did a forward slash renew, and that will pick up all of the new information that comes from my DHCP server. Now, here's something you need to know as well. Uh, for Microsoft exams, they've commonly always said that in order to get 
you know, refreshed information from the DHCP server like I just did, you first have to release the address, then you have to choose renew. So I have to do both of these in two separate steps. The reality is, ever since I think it's been since 2003, Server 2003 and XP, you no longer have to release first. You're supposed to have to just do a forward slash renew, and it should still pick up all of the new configurations from the DHCP server. All right, then, and what's this register DNS item down here? Well, what happens is when a client gets an IP address from its DHCP server, it's supposed to automatically register itself with DNS. That means, then, that other hosts on the network can find my computer by its DNS name or by its fully qualified domain name. Uh, and that makes it easier to access resources in the network. Especially important for servers, but normally we want our clients to also be registered in DNS. Okay, so... What happens, however, if it doesn't properly get registered? For example, here I'm over on the uh, DC Nugget 2008 server, which is the domain controller and DNS server for the client that we've been working with that has my whiteboards and all of that kind of stuff. Well, here is Dell Client 01. It did properly register itself. I, I set it up as, as a static IP address offline here, but um, it did properly register itself. Even if it is a static IP address, it will eventually register itself here properly. So I'm going to delete this to kind of simulate an error. So we don't have uh, that, that client's in here anymore. Well, now what? I could manually create it by right-clicking here and choosing a new host record, and then you just fill in until you get all the, the data that you need there. Or I could do an IP config space forward slash register DNS, which again needs an administrator command prompt. If I can type here, we'll do that. So IP config space forward slash register DNS. And then what it's going to do is it's going to talk to its DNS server and says, here I am, this is my IP address, and this is the name that I'm using. Okay. Now over here on the server, you look at this and you say, oh, great job, James. Doesn't look like it did anything, huh? Well, remember, this is an MMC console, which seems to have a need to be refreshed frequently. So I'm just going to go up here to refresh the screen. And voila, what do you know? It did properly then register itself. And of course, you need a dy uh, DNS server that supports dynamic update to allow that to happen. Typically, that's going to be a, a Windows DNS server, but there are many other uh, versions of DNS or uh, iterations of DNS that work with this as well, including the very popular bind DNS servers. Okay, so I've now properly registered it, and that's what the registered DNS was. There's also this issue here of flush DNS. Uh, and this is very useful if the cache uh, is out of date. So, for example, let me just go to another uh, command prompt here. I'll use my administrator command prompt again. And I'll run as this administrator. And if I do something like ping, what's one of the hosts we've used? How about DC Nugget 2008? Okay. Notice that it's replying with a fully qualified domain name, which tells me that DNS has resolved this to this IP address. And that is what it should look like. There's nothing unusual here right now. But what if we had a networking change or something and we changed the IP address of DC Nugget 2008 to 10.10.10.25? Well, this particular host that we're looking at right now with the command prompt window open, uh, it has already cached this name to this address. And the reason why it caches it is so that it reduces the burden on the DNS server so that it doesn't have to do fresh lookups every time. But in this case, that would be stale data. And what we would want to do then is to uh, flush DNS. So we would do you know, IP config. Let me do that. IP config space forward slash flush DNS. And then what would happen is the next time I would ping this host by name, it would go to the DNS server and say, hey, uh, what is the IP address for this particular host? And it would, this time it would return .25 instead of .20. And I would be, then be able to update my DNS resolver cache to the correct address. Now, the next command you should be aware of is the netstat command. This, again, is kind of an old tried-and-true friend of network troubleshooters. And with this one, it's going to identify what kind of ports I have open, whether or not I have an active connection between you know, my computer here and some other computer on the network, uh, and so forth. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Netstat. If you just do a netstat forward slash question mark, of course, it gives you all of the options. What we're interested in right now is maybe I want to see if, you know, maybe I want to see if I've got the ability to make a remote desktop connection to another system, or if I've already got one established. I might do a netstat, 
And then the key items here are going to be A. And notice if you look up at the A, that's going to give you the all the connections and listening ports. Then I want to see who owns that process I and the process ID associated with each connection. That would be the O. And then the N would show me the addresses and ports in numerical form. So A, O, and then N. That's how I would type this in. And then I press Enter, and it'll give me information about these connections. So for example, I wanted to see if I've got a remote desktop computer computer connection to some other host. And I happen to know that I do because I can see it right down here. If I click on this, this is my Windows Server 2008 server, and I've got you know a, a connection going on there. In the background here is my DNS management that I was working with earlier and so forth. So that's the IP address of that server, and remote desktop and remote assistance takes place over 3389. Okay. So, uh, terminal services also takes place over 3389. And this is, so that's the remote host that I'm connected to. It's an established connection. And I'm connecting from this local host, which is 10.10.10.30, over this randomized port number on this end. But on the receiving end, it's always going to be 3389. So, this is just a good way to confirm whether or not I have that uh, whether or not I have that port open, whether it's an established connection, whether it's a, whether it's listening, and so forth. And then back over here on the server, I also had the same command running. Let's go ahead and take a look at that one. And we'll see here again that we have several local addresses here that are also listening. And a lot of these relate to, for example, 445 is an active directory port that needs to be open, uh, and so forth. You know, 53, that's a port that needs to be open to be able to resolve DNS uh, addresses. So uh, it's also, of course, listening because it's trying to service requests that would come in for service on those ports. And so again, our command that we used here, netstat, and in this particular case, we just used the dash a, dash, zero, dash o, and dash n because we wanted to easily be able to read uh, information about those those ports and those connections. Now then this next utility, the port query, is not particularly on the exam, I don't think. Uh, part of that's because it's not included with any current version of Windows that I know of, but you have to download it from Microsoft. And just search on Microsoft's site, it's very easy to find. Uh, then you install it, which really consists of unzipping it into uh, three files in a specific directory. And I've gone to that directory, which is the port query v2 directory. Now the advantage of this is that I can use port query to query on a name of this server, and I can query it on dash e, which would then point to whichever port I was interested in querying. So this is basically saying, I wonder if port 53 is open on DC Nugget 2008, if it's open and listening. So I'll press enter, and we see that indeed it is listening. Why is that? Because 53 is the DNS port that allows it to resolve uh, DNS queries. Let's go ahead and do another one. How about port um, 80? Now 80 will not work. It's going to hang up for a little while here, but this is not going to work. It's going to say that it's filtered, which is basically the same as saying that it's not listening or, or it could also be blocked. Um, but I know it's not listening on 80 because I don't have a web server over on that server. So uh, what I like about port query here is that uh, in addition to, you know, you know, you can use certain tools like netstat to identify what's listening on my own local system, but how about a remote system? Port query will try to see what's listening on a remote system, and that's what I'm doing here. And you can see here again, I've confirmed that port 80 is filtered over on that destination host, so that means it's not listening there. Now then here we have the ping command, and we've used it quite extensively in the past, but if you want to force whether to use uh, IP version 4 or 6, then you can ping whatever the host is, followed by a dash 4 for version 4, or a dash 6 for version 6, if you've got your IP version 6 addressing all lined up. And we'll talk more about IPv6, at least in brief, uh, shortly here within this, uh, within this nugget. Then there's also a couple of other things here, trace route and path ping. They both perform a similar function. Let me just go ahead and show you, for example, if I do a uh, trace route to www. How about AccuSource? Dot net. And this is a, a website that I have that's just, um, it's not within my own local network here. I just want to give Traceroute a little bit of room to roam. So I'm sending it out uh, across the internet to find some data. So that's what it's doing, it and that's what it does. It just goes through all of the various hops, which are normally going to be network devices. Uh, normally, it's actually going to be routers. But it could also go through computer hosts as well. But anyway, it shows me all the hops that it takes and how long it takes to get 
through each hop. And then if I get an extended, you know, long millisecond delay in one of them, you know, maybe I'm getting uh, 200 milliseconds at one of these hops, that could tell me that that particular router might be close to saturation, for example, and uh, perhaps that's the cause of network communication problems that I might be having. And then let's take a look at our final two commands, trace route and path ping, which both perform a similar function. Their objective is to start at the computer that you're running the command from and to traverse all of the hops and network devices till it gets to its destination. So if I wanted to identify, for example, where there might be a router that could be down or a router that's taking a long time to respond, maybe it's taking a lot of milliseconds to respond, then I can use this utility for that. Now I've, I've kind of run these in the background in advance because path ping especially takes a long time to run, but at least I got it started here. I ran trace route against google.com and it's tracing the route to the destination IP address here and it shows me all the network devices starting with my own home, um, you know, links as router here and on through the ISP and through other resources out there on the internet until eventually it gets to Google. And what I want to look for here is something where it's got milliseconds that take an extremely long time. Now, this one timed out. It's okay if you have a timeout every now and then. But if I have, you know, three stars in a row, that either means it's being blocked at a certain point so it's not allowing things like trace router path ping to go through. Or it could be that that router is down. Or if I get really long delays, like you know, 160 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, all three times, then that might be a router that's saturated or that is having other issues. Now, that router might not be under me, under my purview, so it, it might be out of my control entirely. Or if it is one of my routers, then of course I can go check on it. And then we have path ping as well, which is what Microsoft generally prefers as a diagnostic tool and also on the exam. It does a similar function, it's just that it's a little bit more, more thorough, and so it's going to take a longer time to return all of the results to me. If I'm in a hurry, I'll probably use trace route. If I want to, uh, if I have a little bit of time and I can let path ping do its job, then I prefer path ping instead. In this nugget, we took a look at networking, and this was part one where we started off with a discussion of the Network and Sharing Center. Remember, this is a great way to look at your own host computer's relationship to the rest of the network to identify what kind of a network type it's in and to use certain, several of the links that we saw over on the left to further diagnose and analyze and configure that particular computer's uh, networking. We also took a look at some general troubleshooting ideas, some things to keep in mind. Uh, troubleshooting, like I've said many times in the past, is very generally speaking uh, just properly configuring something in the first place. So uh, that's going to be a big part of it. But there are also certain troubleshooting things that you can do, for example, to identify whether or not you can access your shares properly. And we share with you a few different tips there as well as a number of different tools to properly not only configure your network but to identify where a problem might be and to properly resolve those problems with these tools. Well, I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.